Alright, so a little less. Okay, so this so lecture we're going to talk about thermal expansion. Basically, um, and we know when you heat things, they expand. When you cool them, they contract. That's kind of the general property, uh, or general uh, way things work. Okay, so we're going to start out with, say we have a solid object. We'll make it rectangular, just to uh, keep it simple. And let's say we have dimensions x naught, y naught, and z naught. And again, we're using these uh, yeah, initial values because we're going to heat this object and it'll expand. We'll say we're adding heat to it, so we're raising the temperature. And so there's going to be a change in temperature. That will cause this object to expand. And in general, we're going to talk about uh, you know, how much is this object going to expand. So like, what factors will affect the expansion of this object? And we'll just look at one dimension first. Let's look at, say, x naught, Or more generally, let's just say we have a length, L. And we'll talk about how that length is going to change if we change the temperature. And I'm going to say that L is proportional to the initial length. So that symbol that's uh, proportional to. So it means if we have a, you know, if the initial length was double, then we'd have twice as much. Sorry, this is the change in length proportional to the initial length. So if the initial length was twice as big, it would grow twice as much. You know, this, this is a direct proportion. So if this was like three times the value, the change would be three times as much. And again, I'm stating this and just saying it's kind of obvious. Why is that? Let's say we have a meter stick. Or let's, yeah, we could say a meter stick or generally any object that is one meter long. And if we heat it a certain amount, it's going to grow. So this would be L naught. And this would be delta L. Now, what if we had an object that was twice as long to begin with? We could just draw a line down the middle and say this much is going to grow this amount delta L. And this piece is going to grow an amount delta L as well. And so the overall change in length, will, you know, this is twice the initial length. So the growth will be twice as much. So this statement hopefully is, you know, reasonable, or believable. Um, ultimately, uh, experiments can be the ultimate test, but uh, well, it's a reasonable assumption. Okay, now what else does this depend on? Obviously, how much we change the temperature. And the assumption that we're going to make is that the change in length is proportional to the change in temperature. So if we have, say, an object and we increase its temperature by 12, or, yeah, to say 12 Celsius degrees, it's going to grow a certain amount. If we increase the same object by 24 degrees, it'll grow twice as much. And again, that's not necessarily something that has to be true. Uh, the expansion we're talking about is called linear expansion. Now, um, do things really expand perfectly in a perfectly linear way? Uh, not exactly, but to a very good approximation uh, that, that'll work out. So uh, this is an assumption, but it's a very good one to make. Now, the other factor that will determine delta L, like how much this object is going to grow in any particular direction. Uh, also, the type of material. And so we can combine all this into a single equation. Where the overall change in length that's proportional to L naught and it's proportional to the change in temperature 
And again, these are actually different symbols. This means proportional to. This is the uh, linear um, expansion coefficient. It's a number. And um, alpha depends on what type of material we're talking about. Uh, first, let's look at the units for alpha. Uh, if we just solve for that variable, we'd have delta L over L naught delta T. So here we have a length over a length that cancels out. So the units for alpha are 1 over Celsius degrees. Now the values, you know, how do you know what alpha is? It depends on the material. And again, those are the kind of things you look up in the book or, you know, they've got whole tables of these things. And I'll just write down a couple of values. I'm going to look at, uh, say, aluminum. Aluminum is 23 times 10 to the minus 6. So this is the substance. And this is alpha in units of inverse Celsius degrees. So that's aluminum. Uh, brass, very similar. 19 times 10 to the minus 6. Um, I'll look at another metal, like lead. 13 times 10 to the minus 6. Basically, they're all times 10 to the minus 6 here. I'll do one more, uh, kind of the most extreme value I can find on this table. Glass. Now, there's different types of glass. This is called Pyrex. That's 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus 6. So, again, they're all, you know, some, usually a two-digit number. Uh, except for glass, times 10 to the minus 6. And that alpha is a very small number. It's like 0.000023 in these units for aluminum. And so what that means is things do not expand too much uh, when you heat them, typically. It would take a very large temperature change. However, if we look at this equation, there's two ways that we can cause a significant change in the dimensions. One of them, maybe not so practical, but if you have a large temperature change. Now, the reason I say that's not so practical is because right now these substances we're looking at are solids. And there's a limit how much you can change the temperature of a solid because eventually it's going to melt. So delta T, there are limits. Typically, we're not going to be able to change it enough to really make that much of a difference. Okay, so that's one way in theory you could do that but again you eventually you'll melt the thing but l naught that one uh yeah that could actually be significant you know kind of a classic example of that so you have uh railroad tracks they've got these metal things that the the train wheels roll on and those can be you know miles or you know tender and hundreds of miles long and so if on a warm day if that entire thing heats up you could have a very significant expansion, which could cause some problems. And so what they do is they kind of have them think, and like uh, roads, now also can be very long, like the asphalt. And if that heats up, the whole road can expand. Now, I should point out that, uh, you know, the ground will heat up and expand as well, but uh, they'll expand different rates. And so having the road expand, if there's nowhere for it to expand into, that can cause problems. And in severe cases, that could cause the road to buckle. Uh, and so what they do, you might even notice this when you're driving on a tollway or something, you get this kind of periodic sound. They make these roads kind of segmented so that they have room to grow without hitting each other. So it's like you have a like asphalt and then a little gap and then another one and another one. So they kind of build these gaps so that they have room to expand without uh, kind of buckling. So again, this one, you know, for real world examples, 
the length could be extremely long where you could have, you know, a temperature change could have a noticeable effect. Now, usually these are very, uh, delta L is a very small number. However, that can still be important. Uh, if you have like a very precise machine where things fit together really well, when they heat up, if they expand, you know, that could cause problems. And so, uh, yeah, like your car engine, for instance. If it gets very hot, you know, the metal can expand and that can start, uh, you know, you have parts moving past each other. And yeah, that can cause problems. We have to keep things from getting too hot. Okay, so this is now, in this table, I only mentioned solids, as you can see, aluminum, brass, lead, and glass. Liquids also expand. However, we can't have a coefficient alpha for a liquid because we're talking about expansion in a particular direction. And liquids, you know, they, they fill up whatever, like say you have a liquid in some random looking container. And of every color of marker except for blue. Anyways, so I say here's the liquid. If it expands, like say the glass doesn't expand very much, but the liquid does, the level is just going to rise. So if you had a solid here, it would want to expand in all directions. But with a liquid, it doesn't care. It can just go up. Easiest thing to do. So liquids do not have a definite shape. And so we can't really talk about... Uh, this coefficient alpha, this is expansion in a particular direction. So again, we cannot uh, talk about that for anything except solids. Uh, gases are a different story entirely because they don't, they just occupy whatever volume. They won't really expand. Um, but what will happen if you heat up a gas, the pressure will increase. If the volume doesn't increase, you know, heat up a gas, they'll increase the pressure, which will push harder on the walls. And, you know, if it's a balloon, that can cause it to expand. But, uh, yeah, so for this topic, we're just talking about solids and liquids. Okay. Now, uh, again, I wrote delta L. This is just for any particular direction. So if we go back to this solid, let me try to write this over here. We can say delta X is alpha X naught delta T. Uh, delta Y is alpha Y naught delta T and delta Z is alpha Z naught delta T. So each, uh, it's going to expand, each of these dimensions is going to change and so like the way I drew it, X naught is bigger, it's going to expand more in the X direction than in the Y or Z directions. Okay, now, what about the volume of this, uh, this object? That's going to change as well if the dimensions change. If each of these dimensions increases, the volume of this solid is going to increase as well. And what I want to do is I want to find the final volume of this object. I'll just call it VF or V final. So that would be its final length in the x direction, which would be x naught plus delta x, and then times y naught plus delta y, and then times z naught plus delta z. Now this looks kind of like a mess algebraically, because we have these terms, like if we want to multiply these first two terms together, uh, we have to do, you know, we have to distribute everything, more commonly called like this foiling process first, uh, inner, outer, and last. So we're going to have four terms if we just multiply this, and then we'll have to multiply each of those terms by each of these numbers. So we're going to have a total of eight things here. And it looks like it's going to greatly complicate things. But we're going to look at a more realistic example. Um, let's look at this solid. I'm just going to make up some numbers. Let's say x naught is 2 meters, y naught is 1 meter, and z naught is 1 meter. 
And let's say delta T is 10 Celsius degrees. Let's say this is brass, just for example. So let's calculate delta X. We'd have 19. Then we have times 10 to the negative 6. I'm going to write it like that with a positive exponent on the bottom. Uh, I just prefer it that way. And then times x naught, which is 2 meters. And then delta t was 10 Celsius degrees. So if we multiply this, uh, 19 times 2 is 38. And then 10, we can just take off 1 over here. So we have 38 over 10 to the fifth meters. If we convert to millimeters, let's do that. Uh, pick out a thousand. We have 0 0.38 millimeters. And delta Y and delta Z are going to be half that because they're half the initial length. So again, this is, I mean, if you look at a meter stick, you know, a centimeter is a, you know, about the width of your finger or something like that. Millimeter is a pretty small thing. This is less than half a millimeter. So these delta X, delta Y, and delta Z are going to be very small numbers. Now, why do we care about that? What if we do uh, delta X times delta Y? We're going to have like 0.38 millimeters times 0.19 millimeters. Or if we even keep it in meters, that might be more... Uh, instructive, we'd have, let's say this is going to be around 3.8 times 10 to the minus 4 meters times 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4 meters, um, say around 7.5 times 10 to the minus 8 power meter squared. And so delta X and delta Y are small. If you multiply delta X and delta Y, we're getting something extremely small. And so basically, and we'd even have a factor, if we did the entire thing, we'd have delta X, delta Y, delta Z. We'd even end up with, uh, yeah, like that, uh, multiply three of these deltas together and get an even smaller number. And so the rule that we're going to use here is because delta X, delta Y, and delta Z are so small, we're going to ignore any term that has a pair of deltas or, you know, three of them. So let's work this out. Let's multiply these first two together. So we have X naught, Y naught. And then we'd have X naught, delta Y. Plus delta x y naught, and then the last term is delta x times delta y, and we ignore that term. So all we did is foil this first pair, and we ignored the delta x delta y term. Uh, ultimately, if we kept it, again, remember this product delta x delta y was well, somewhere around 10 to the minus 8 power. And if we kept that term there, we'd eventually multiply it by Z naught, which is like a meter. So again, we're going to have such an incredibly small number, we can safely disregard it. We're never going to notice a number that small. Uh, so this is totally valid to do. And now we have to multiply these two things. So let's start out by multiplying each of these terms by Z naught. So we have X naught, Y naught, Z naught, uh, plus X naught, delta Y, Z naught, plus delta X, Y naught, Z naught. So we, multiply, we distribute this Z naught into each of these terms. And now we want to do the same for delta Z. And that's going to be X naught, Y naught, delta Z, and we are done. Because when we multiply delta Z by this term, you know, we're going to have a delta Z, delta Y. Here we're going to have a delta X, delta Z. We ignore those. 
So we end up cutting out half of our terms. So again, simplified things a bit. So now what I want to do, um, x naught, y naught, z naught, this is just our initial volume. Now, the volume of this solid, it's a rectangular solid, so the volume would just be x naught, y naught, z naught. Now, this term, we have x naught, y naught, or I'm sorry, delta y is going to be alpha y naught delta t. So we have x naught delta y z naught. Similarly, here, delta x, that's alpha x naught delta t times y naught z naught and then here we have x naught y naught times alpha z naught delta t okay now um kind of running out of room on the board here now let's look at these terms here we have an x naught y naught z naught here we have x naught y naught z naught, x naught y naught. Every one of these terms has an x naught y naught z naught, which is v naught. So what's left over in this first term, we have alpha delta t. So again, we take out the x naught y naught and z naught, we have alpha delta t. Here we take out x naught y naught z naught, we have alpha delta t again. And similarly with this third term. So what we get, um, I'm going to write it over here. We have V final equals V initial. Um, I'm being consistent with this notation. Okay, so V initial plus V initial or plus here we have three alpha delta t. Okay, so yeah, this thing in parentheses is just three alpha delta t, and then we multiply that by v naught. Now, if we take if we take v final minus v initial, I'm gonna put this in parentheses. So this is kind of our final equation that we're looking for, or semi-final equation anyways. So if you look at uh, what I initially wrote, just for linear expansion in general, the change in length in any direction is alpha times its initial length times the change in temperature. If we look at the change in volume, we have three alpha times the initial volume times delta t. So kind of like the same equation, except we're dealing with volumes. And instead of alpha, we have three alpha. And um, I don't have room to write this, so I'm just going to erase this. Basically, our equation for volume expansion is, instead of writing three alpha, we just call it beta. So this is our basic equation for volume expansion. So just like delta L is alpha, L naught delta T, delta V is beta, V naught delta T. Okay. And for solids, beta equals 3 alpha. Now if you look at your table in the book, I can kind of hold it up here. Um, yeah, if you got a table like this in the book, I mean, you can see beta only exists for, or Alpha only exists for solids, but beta worked for liquids as well. And um, if you just look at the numbers for the solids, beta is always three times alpha. So if we were just dealing with solids, we wouldn't need alpha and beta. But uh, because liquids, this equation doesn't even make any sense for liquids, we've got this for um we have a, it, a liquid as its own coefficient that can't be, you know, this idea of just expanding in a particular direction doesn't 
really makes sense for liquids. Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea behind thermal expansion. And it's called linear expansion because, um, yeah, it's, uh, like if you look in a table, um, every time you look at like experimental results, a lot of tables, they're just based on experimental measurements, and you'll see, you know, like they always have a little paragraph underneath explaining how they determine those. And again, I didn't copy that information down in the notes, which I should have, but basically, they'd probably tell you like what temperature these measurements were taken. at, Because uh, maybe at a different temperature, these values would change a little bit. And so really, the expansion might not be perfectly linear. But uh, to a very good approximation, these values are linear. Okay. Uh, so in a sense, we're kind of done. We can see how the dimensions of an object change, like the dimensions of a solid. And overall, we can see how the, um, <clears throat> the volume of an object will change as well. There's an interesting question, though. That's what we can talk about. And let's say we have a washer, like a metal washer. Say it looks like this. So this is all solid here. This is metal. Say it's iron. And there's a hole in the middle. Now, what if we heat this up? What's going to happen to this hole in the middle? Is it going to get bigger, stay the same, or get smaller? And it's not exactly an obvious. Uh, there's no obvious answer to this question. Um, one thing you could, okay, say you heat it up. If you look at the circumference of this object, that's going to grow. Like, if you were to straighten this out, it would just grow in a line and then kind of reform it in a circle. So the circumference would get bigger, which would make uh, the hole bigger. However, the, uh, the width is also going to increase because um, it's heating up. That dimension is going to increase as well. And so, you know, circumference increases. You might think, okay, the hole's going to get bigger. But then you think, okay, the width increases. Maybe the hole's going to stay the same size, or maybe it's even going to get smaller. If the width grows more than the circumference. Uh, now, again, just looking at our equation. You can probably determine that the circumference is going to grow more than the width. Uh, just because the, the circumference is definitely going to be, you know, more than the width of the thing. And you'd probably expect the hole to get bigger just based on that. And that is actually what happens. Um, I actually worked it out in class once, showing how you can find, like, the exact dimensions of the hole before and after and see that it grows. Uh, I don't really do that anymore, though, so... Uh, the book had a really good description. There's actually two things the book did that I like to explain how this, uh, this hole in the middle would get bigger. One, let's look at a simpler shape. Let's say we have actually, I'm going to make this bigger. Let's say you have a metal like this, where these are all squares, and these are all solid, but the one in you know, the middle is a hole, so there's no material here. And let's say these dimensions are one centimeter and one centimeter, so like they're all the same dimensions. And so again, the, the hole in the middle has dimensions equal to one centimeter. Because it shares a side 
with this, with you know, these pieces. They're all squares. So what happens if we heat it up? Again, forget these lines in the middle. Say it was just a rectangle like this. You know, we can draw these lines. And each of these dimensions, like let's just look at this piece here. This length here, this side is going to go to one centimeter plus delta L. Where delta L is going to be very small. But anyways, it's going to grow. And so the dimensions of the hole are, are going to grow by the same amount. Because the, the hole is just made up of these pieces of the metal. And so the, um, the hole is going to grow just like the uh, material that is surrounding it. So if this thing was iron, you know, we can look at the dimensions of the hole, which would be, say, x naught, y naught. Uh, that would be the area would be x naught times y naught. Or right, let's just look at them individually. Then they're going to grow like this. They're going to go to x naught plus delta x and y naught plus delta y. So they're each going to grow just like the material that they are surrounded by. Uh, so if this is iron, you can actually calculate delta x for like the dimensions of this hole. Because again, it's just going to be this dimension of this, uh, like, iron square above it. Now, I'm looking at a nice uh, way of looking at this. Let's say we have a more random shape. So you have, like, a metal plate with some strange hole cut out of it that's not any particular geometric shape. Now, how is this hole going to grow if we heat up this metal? Uh, the book gave a really good description of this. Imagine just taking a, like a digital picture of this and zooming in, or just like expanding the picture. Everything expands the same way. So like a hole in a material is going to expand exactly as if it was made out of the material that is surrounding it. And it doesn't matter what shape the material is. It's always going to do that. So that's uh, you know, an important application of that. If we look at, uh, again, the book has an example. So you have like a radiator that's filled with fluid. So like your car has this cooling fluid. So there's a cavity in your radiator. So your radiator, I'm not going to try to draw it. Say it's just like a block of metal. And there's a cavity inside that has the cooling fluid. And when the car heats up, you know, the radiator is going to expand. And the, uh, the fluid inside is going to expand as well. But the fluid's going to expand a lot more. And so, like, how much... So what happens if your radiator is filled with fluid, when the fluid expands, it's going to come out. And, you know, leak out if you... Uh, if you don't give it a, somewhere to go, it's going to find a way to come out. Uh, it could, if it needs to, it'll like break the metal and crack the metal radiator and leak out that way. Uh, because the fluid wants to expand more than the metal surrounding it. And so, in order to know how much... Uh, well, what you would have is you'd have this go into a reservoir. So you'd have a hose for the excess fluid to go into this reservoir that's outside. And in order to determine like how much fluid is going to escape, how much is going to you know, leak out of this cavity, you'd have to find the delta V for the fluid and also delta V for the metal. Like, let's just say an example. Let's say that the radiator initially had a capacity of 10 gallons. So that was the initial capacity for this radiator. And let's say it's filled, so there's 10 gallons of fluid, in, 10 gallons of fluid inside. And let's say the fluid, if it expands up to 12 gallons when, when it's heated up. 
So that's like two extra gallons that have nowhere to go. But you're not going to have two gallons leak out of the radiator because the radiator itself is going to expand and the cavity inside will expand just like it was made out of the material of the radiator itself. So if this is made out of iron. And so again, once the radiator expands, it'll accommodate more fluid, but the fluid's going to expand more. So some of it's going to have to come out and go into a reservoir. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, the shape of this cavity inside the reservoir, that might be fairly complicated, but again, those details don't really matter. The whole cavity is going to expand just like the metal that surrounds it. Okay, so um, one more application I want to talk about here. It's something called a bimetallic strip. So I'll draw it. Let's say we have, you know, you might be able to tell from the name. Bi means two, and metallic, obviously, it's metal. So you have two metal pieces welded together. Let's say we have aluminum and brass. Now, you can see from the table, aluminum has a larger coefficient. And so if we heat this up, the aluminum is going to grow more than the brass. But they're welded together, so the aluminum can't just grow long. It can't do this. Like, say there's the aluminum, and then the brass would be a little shorter. But they're welded together. They can't slide past each other. So what's going to happen if we heat this up, it's going to go like this if we heat it. And if we cool it, it's going to bend the other way. So let's call the bimetallic strip. If you heat it, it bends one way. If you cool it, it bends the other way. Uh, there's some definite applications to this. Uh, one of them, let's say we have um, this bimetallic strip. Again, these are metals, which are good conductors of electricity. We haven't really talked about electricity yet in this class. But one thing, um, say we have a battery. I'll just draw a battery. Um, there. Let's say it looks like this. And again, we'll get a current flowing. You have to, if you just have a battery, do this. You connect a wire to some piece of metal, and then the wire here. Nothing's going to happen. Because in order for current to flow, it needs a closed loop. And so, um, let's do this. Now, I probably drew this wrong. I'm going to reverse these directions. So, um, so aluminum and brass. I'm going to change these directions just because of the way I drew this. And so, again, if we heat it, it's going to go curve this way. And if we cool it, it's going to go this way. So again, let's say we have this um, metal contact here. So normally there's a contact here. So again, this is not connected to the bimetallic strip, but they're touching each other. We can have a little spring to make sure that they, they're normally in contact with each other. And... Yeah, let's, uh, yeah, let's say we wire this up. So we're going to get a current flowing through here. Now we have a closed loop. But something else we're going to learn when we study electricity and electrical circuits is when you have a current flowing through a metal, it's going to heat it up. And so if the current gets too great, uh, this is going to heat up enough that it's going to actually you know, bend away and break contact, and then the current's going to stop because, uh, well, it doesn't have a complete path anymore. And so uh, once it reaches a certain temperature, the contact is going to be broken and the current stops. And that could be a good safety thing to keep things from getting too hot. And then what's also nice is after the current is stopped, 
uh, this object will eventually cool off and then it will re-establish contact and the current's going to start flowing again. So you could use something like this to regulate temperature, where when it gets too hot, it breaks contact, and then after a while, it's going to cool off and re-establish a contact. Um, the book is an example of like a coffee pot, where it's a very simple way, you know, once it reaches a certain temperature, contact will break and keep it from getting hotter, but it won't cool off too much either because once it cools off, it'll reestablish current and then start heating it up again. And so, yeah, there are applications for a bimetallic strip. They can be used as switches in general. It could just be a purely safety mechanism, not even designed to maintain the temperature, but just keep things from overheating. That when it reaches that point, it'll break the contact. And, uh, or it can be used to regulate temperature on an object like, uh, like a coffee maker. And no, that's how, well, ovens do the same thing. If you turn on your oven and just sit around, like if you have a gas oven, you know, you hear the gas turn on and eventually it's gonna turn off and then it'll turn on again. Uh, I don't know if it uses a bimetallic strip for that. Uh, I suppose you could, but uh, yeah, it just, it maintains the temperature in a very crude way. When it gets too hot, it shuts off. And then when it reaches a certain temperature, it'll turn back on. So it, may, it keeps temperature in a certain range. It's not a very precise, uh, yeah, if you set your oven to 350, you don't think it's always going to be 350 degrees in there. But uh, yeah, it maintains it in a certain range. Okay, um, so I think that's it for linear expansion. Uh, yeah, so that'll be it for now.